InfoSecon so far. Uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, John Clay. He's Director of Global Threat Communications at Trend Micro. He's a cybersecurity expert for Trend Micro, and he's had more than 25 years of experience in the security industry. That is a long time. He's responsible for managing marketing messages and external publication of the threat research and intelligence within Trend Micro, as well as different core technologies. He's been a speaker I know at our conferences in the past. He's had hundreds of speaking sessions around the globe. He focuses on the threat landscape and use of big data and protecting against today's sophisticated threats. John has held roles within Trend Micro as sales engineer, sales engineering manager, training manager, and product marketing manager for SMB prior to taking over as director of global threat communications. John has a BS in electrical engineering with emphasis in computer engineering from Michigan State. So anybody from Ohio State, we don't want to hear anything from you right now. His experience has given him a broad technical background and understanding of the security requirements of businesses, as well as an excellent understanding of the threat landscape. And we're lucky to have him here today. I'm, uh, John would like, I think, to have the, if you have questions, if you could save them till the end. And John will be happy to uh, you know, answer them at that time. And at this point, I will turn it over to our, the illustrious Mr. Clay. Thanks, Joel. Appreciate it. Hey, welcome, everybody. Uh, glad you could make it today. And like Joel said, I've always had a, a, a good time going out there to your actual physical event over the last several years to speak. And unfortunately, as we all know, we can't do that this year. So hopefully the, the virtual event is, is working for everybody. You know, I'm sitting in my home office right now and I, I actually work from home all the time, but uh, it's kind of interesting looking out the window, seeing snow on the ground and uh, all the people in the East Coast that are gonna look forward to that. I'm in Colorado, so uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a harbinger of what's gonna happen here pretty soon, but uh, hope everybody's staying safe and, and strong. So today I wanna talk a little bit about cloud attacks. Um, we've been working in the cloud for many years now. We've got researchers that have been researching all the different areas of the cloud and how, how it can be attacked and so forth. So I want to give you some, some ideas, uh, look at what kind of attacks you're probably going to see in the cloud. Uh, I'll go through some scenarios and some uh, um, case studies uh, today and then, and then wrap it up, obviously, with giving you some su suggestions on how you can uh, uh, implement some security practices to help Im uh, improve your cloud security posture. So with that, let's get this thing moving. Um, so first thing I wanted to highlight, you know, everybody wants to know what are some of the motives that these attackers have, right? And it really depends on where in your network they are attacking, right? Today, obviously, ransomware is a big motivation, data theft, uh, even in ransomware attacks, data theft is usually the first part of the, uh, of the attack scenario that, that is happening. But for cloud, uh, certainly a lot of organizations are starting to put critical data in the cloud. So data theft is a big piece of one of the motives that, uh, for, um, for targeting cloud infrastructures. The other one is crypto mining. So crypto mining has been interesting over the years uh, because it, you know it's it's it can be lucrative. But one of the things that the criminals have found uh, is that servers tend to be much better at crypto mining than PCs or mobile phones, for example, which they've tried. Uh, so obviously, you know, the cloud infrastructure is made up of a lot of servers, a lot of um, uh, virtual servers. And so crypto mining is, uh, we're seeing a lot of activity in that area. Uh, I mentioned ransomware. So ransoming cloud accounts uh, in this case, uh, that they are looking again to monetize a, an attack on the, on the cloud infrastructure. Um, uh, you know, the extortion is a big factor in their stuff. You know, we talked to data theft earlier. So, you know, today with ransomware, for example, they're double whamming organizations. They're doing uh, not only a ransomware attack where they encrypt the files and, and hold it for, for ransom, but then if you don't pay the ransom, they say, hey, we stole your, we did data theft as well, and we're going to uh, we're gonna pay or publish, you know, right? You pay or publish us. So uh, that's another challenge. Espionage. Uh, you know, if there's uh, government organizations here uh, and, and even in, in uh, the uh, uh, capital side of things, 
we have espionage going on and then sabotage. Um, a lot of organizations, they may look to take down your cloud infrastructure uh, in some cases, you know, again, depending on who you are, what your organization does, um, the attackers may look at doing sabotage. So those are some of the motives that we see uh, in the in, in attacks on the cloud. When you look at exposure and the types of attacks, and I'm going to go through a number of these in more detail, but just to give you some idea of where they are targeting, what they're targeting, vulnerable software is a big one, um, whether it's web applications, databases, APIs are really becoming a big one. Uh, misconfigurations is another challenge for a lot of organizations, and the criminals are taking advantage of it, right? Um, and you see a couple of the attacks that we've seen, whether it was Tesla or Capital One, uh, Open S3 buckets are big in the news uh, that they find, open databases. Uh, and then another one is authentication, authorization attacks. Um, you know, so what they're doing account manipulation, uh, using phishing, credential stuffing, credential theft. Uh, and the last one is cloud providers glitches. So, you know, obviously everybody is working with a cloud provider in this, in these cases and uh, with your infrastructure. And a lot of times there are glitches there. And so the, the criminals will take advantage of that as well. You know, if you look at um, the Verizon uh, report uh, this year, um, cloud assets were involved in 24% of breaches. Uh, you know, that number keeps going up every year. Um, if you look at the breaches that it really involved email and web application servers in 73% of the time, uh, obviously Office 365, which is cloud infrastructure, that's a big one they're targeting. They're, uh, those, those users very much uh, always looking to steal credentials of Office 365 users. Uh, additionally, it says 77% of those cloud breaches also involve breach credentials. So like I said, they are really looking for credential theft and you'll see that in my uh, next couple of slides. Um, so this really looks at, you know, the, the cloud security is becoming more and more important inside organizations. And we'll talk about some of the challenges as we, as we move forward. So let's look at uh, an overview of a number of the different cloud attacks that we see. And when you look at this slide, you're gonna see, you know, from initial access to examples that we give, privilege escalation persistence. So they're, you know, again, in a lot of cases, they may not attack the cloud directly, your cloud infrastructure directly. They may come in through lateral movement uh, or privilege escalation. And then what's the impact and goal? And you can see here some of the things that we talked about earlier, crypto mining, ransomware, data exfiltration, um, you know, those kind of things. So first one is account discovery. And when you think about um, the, the cloud today, what the attackers tend to be doing is they are, they are definitely utilizing the tools available to them to scan the internet for cloud instances uh, and account discovery. Um, this can be from insiders, uh, unfortunately, that, those are the hard ones to, to detect. Um, insider threat is very difficult today, uh, there's, but there's brute forcing, credential stuffing. Uh, we see a ton of brute force password attacks uh, out there against our customers. Um, the cloud console, the control plane that's utilized, uh, they are going after those. If I can get uh, the credentials for the administrator of the cloud console, I have access to a lot of uh, things to do within your cloud infrastructure, obviously. So again, looking to steal those credentials, uh, it allows them to create, modify accounts. Uh, they can create, modify different roles. Um, that makes it a challenge for you because if they do have those keys to the administrative account, then they can really do a lot of damage. They can, um, they can create other accounts, for example, uh, and build those into your infrastructure. And what they tend to do in these types of attacks is really uh, they can then drop crypto mining on a lot of the servers. Uh, they could drop ransomware. Um, they could ransom the cloud accounts, right? So if they if they obtain the the access to the cloud administrative account uh, and then change the password for that, you guys can't get access to it. They may try to um, extort you for getting that account back. The second one we look at is application compromise. So these tend to be, you know, Google Dork, Shodan Search. You know, when they do a Shodan Search, you know, and this goes back to my first point where they're scanning the internet for these accounts and these, these um, uh, systems. 
one of the things that, that uh, it can give them is what is running on those devices, on those IPs. And, uh, and they can look at and look for vulnerabilities of the applications running on those systems. And that, that allows them to exploit a lot of those vulnerabilities. Uh, exploitation of vulnerabilities is one of the big things that we're seeing today and utilized today by the criminals. You know, recently you saw um, uh, zero logon, the zero logon uh, vulnerability that is, it is now actually being used in a lot of these ransomware attacks that we're seeing. The Riot Gang, for example, which is in the news right now because of their um, going after the hospitals inside the uh, U.S., the Riot Gang has been using zero logon to get access to the domain controllers and get and take over the domain controller administrative uh, credentials. So one of the, some of the things they can do if they have application compromise, they can spin up instances, they can disable services, they can deploy containers, for example, they can do VM container escapes inside your or and you know again this is really to um, improve persistence. Uh, disabling services, they wipe their tracks, so to speak, uh, to try and make sure you don't see them in your in your network or in your cloud infrastructure at that time. And you can see here, there's a number of different end goals that can be um, uh, utilized by these these criminals at this point. The third one we talk about is database discovery. And this is what's probably been in the news the most, uh, which is these exposed S3 buckets. Um, we're starting though to see exposed Elasticsearch uh, instances. So that's also a challenge. So anybody who has databases uh, um, hosted in the cloud tend to have these challenges. A lot of organizations are using S3 buckets today. And again, uh, a lot of cases it's misconfigured services. Uh, that they will do, they'll change the, uh, uh, the, the uh, configurations of these exposed S3 buckets uh, that are out there. You know, if you look at it, um, when an S3 bucket is spun up, um, the default is that it is not exposed to the internet. So somebody has to make a change to the configuration of that S3 bucket in order to expose it to the internet. And that's what the criminals are hoping for. As part of their search, they're looking for S3 buckets all the time out there. And again, in this instance, it's really about data exfiltration because again, databases tend to hold those that critical data, the data that they want to uh, steal. And so you see a lot of data exfiltration when, when data discovery is the initial access. And the last one I wanted to highlight are API keys exposure. Um, more and more cloud tools are utilizing APIs and the, uh, the manufacturers of these uh, applications and these services are tending to support APIs. And this can be a challenge. Um, we're seeing a lot of public GitHub repositories that are including this stuff, um, exposing API keys. Uh, compromised dev machines. So, you know, when I was talking to my cloud expert inside Trend, one of the researchers, he said he would absolutely, if he was going to target an organization, the first person he would target is a developer. Why? Those developers have access to some very critical data, critical systems, uh, critical applications. And so, um, if they can compromise that developer's machine or the developer's accounts, they can impersonate that developer. They can use social engineering attacks against others inside the organization. Um, th th those developers have a lot of power inside the organization. Uh, and again, in most cases, this is going to be around data exfiltration. I want to get access to what those developers are working on. I want to get access to the systems that they're working on, and that gives them the ability to laterally move if they if they compromise those uh, that de those dev machines. So these are some of the different um, things that we're seeing today. Now I want to go into a little bit more detail into some of these areas and give you some cloud attack scenarios that we have seen. Um, I mentioned cryptocurrency, right? And if you think about a lot of people are wondering, why are they still doing cryptocurrency mining? Well, if you look at Bitcoin, like this is the average price of Bitcoin, market cap of Bitcoin over the last uh, several months, you can see it's pretty steady. In fact, I just heard today that Bitcoin has uh, valued uh, uh, at 10,000 or above per coin 
for the last hundred days. And that's a, that's a first in that, uh, with that cryptocurrency. So it's pretty steady now. In the past, what we saw, you know, when crypto, when Bitcoin went skyrocketed, we saw cryptocurrency mining all over the place, right? Because it, it was, every coin was worth so much money. But now it's been pretty steady um, and it, it had dropped really bad. Uh, and so they stopped doing cryptocurrency mining because it wasn't worth it. But now it's been pretty steady over the last, um, this year, for example, and we we do see growth in cryptocurrency mining um, or the total market caps of, of a lot of these cryptocurrencies, and so it definitely still is is lucrative to these to these criminals, and so obviously what that means is they want to continue to mine on a regular basis, and so and again as I mentioned earlier the the server. Um, the server resources that are available to them when they get uh, access to a server is much better at cryptocurrency mining than, than like a PC or a mobile device. So cryptocurrency mining is one of the takeaways, you know, if they get access to a cloud server, um, they will definitely be dropping cryptocurrency mining on that at some point. Uh, usually it's one of the later stages of what they're doing. They do stuff before that, um, maybe data exfiltration or something, but then at some point they'll drop cryptocurrency mining to just start making some money. This is an example of what one of the attacks we saw. So again, that target discovery, that, that criminal at there at the top there is going to be scanning the internet, looking for hosts with open ports looking for Docker containers with exposed APIs, uh, looking for application with open ports, for example. Uh, and once they find those and they can access those systems, then they download that payload. Uh, and again, that payload tends to uh, be some form of cryptocurrency mining. Now, one of the things that's interesting is, and we, had, we actually did a research report recently where we talked about um, the botnet actors going after home routers and they are fighting over home router access to get access to these home networks. Well, similar thing here is because you can see they search for other cryptocurrency mining malware processes on these systems and kill them. So they're, they're competing with others, obviously, out there that may be doing the same thing on your systems. And they're going to wipe off the previous actor or, or malicious group that's, that's mining uh, through your uh, cloud service or cloud systems, and they're going to take them out. Then they start their own uh, cryptocurrency mining process, and then they connect to a cryptocurrency pool. Uh, again, they, why cryptocurrency? It really is um, anonymous. They can stay away from law enforcement if, it, if for some reason it, it does get caught. So organizations need to think about that. Um, uh, there could be multiple groups inside your network at some point, uh, or they could be selling access right to cryptocurrency miners out there uh, because they have access to your system. So they do that as well. This I, I threw this up because this was an actual um, uh, item that we saw where the cryptocurrency miner put in a uh, uh, updated a a. Uh, um, a script that was running on the, one of the servers. And you can see here, disclaimer, number one, I only want to mine. Number two, I don't want your data or anything or even a ransom. Please, if you find this code, don't post it, uh, about it. Uh, let's talk. And he gives the name, uh, the uh, address of where you can, you can contact the, uh, the miner. So really, you know, it, he, he doesn't want to do anything bad for you. He just wants to use your system to mine uh, coins, and, which I guess isn't, isn't a bad thing, right? But uh, kind of funny. These uh, these cr criminals' minds work a little differently, I think, than you and I's. But uh, uh, but this is just an example of what we see. So uh, in this case, it was simply a cryptocurrency miner, right? Which you know, who's going to believe that, right? Uh, the next one I wanted to highlight is the Capital One breach. So this is. Um, this is an interesting uh, case here, um, and there's actually a you can download the press release and the file that talks about it, and we're gonna we're gonna kind of go through this a little bit. Um, this was the the case that uh, where Capital One got some of their uh, cloud systems uh, compromised, some of the servers running in their cloud, but uh, you can see here highlighted in yellow a few things that 
caused the problem and caused the infection and compromise. First, there was a firewall misconfiguration. Uh, again, we, we, we talked about misconfigurations earlier, right? So they're searching for those misconfigurations regularly, right? So in this case, there was a firewall. They were able to uh, obtain security credentials uh, for an account. Uh, right, so there again, this is where the credential theft comes into play as well. Um, second command, they were listing buckets, right? So they're trying to figure out what buckets are available to them in this compromised uh, network. And then lastly, they did a sync command, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about all of these. These are the um, uh, if you look at if you're familiar with the MITRE attack framework, these are some of the uh, steps and some of the areas that. Uh, where the MITRE attack frame, excuse me, framework can come into play. And so if, we, if you look at how this happened, you have the attacker out there somewhere in the world. And he was, first and foremost, he, he was working to hide his access, right? So he used a Tor network. He used a VPN service uh, that was available to hide his, himself from the organization. The second thing, he did a query and found an EC2 instance with full access IM role. So we found, so, and again, a misconfigured mod security uh, um, uh, web application firewall was, was utilized here. So once he found that, that open um, EC2 that was open to the internet and it had a, a, an account tied to it, uh, and there was a misconfiguration of the uh, web application firewall. It allowed him to trick that web application firewall to relay commands to a metadata service uh, that was available to him. So inside the um, Capital One network, there was a, the private infrastructure. Uh, there was a, a uh, EC2 metadata service uh, available. Uh, and you can see some of the information here. And he was, he was able to do an LS command to list all the existing buckets, uh, S3 buckets that were uh, available in that private infrastructure. So once he was able to do that, he was then able to do a sync command to copy all the confidential data from those buckets. So again, when you think about uh, S3 buckets in almost every case in this uh, here, it's going to be data exfiltration. So they're going to they're compromising the account, getting access to the to the network, uh, finding the other AWS S3 buckets inside, and then sync commanding to steal all of the data back to his uh, repository. So that's what happened there. If you look at for example, these are all the, the attack IDs. So there was an exploit of an SSRF vulnerability. Um, they don't know on, on the analyzing the architecture and configuration process what happened, posture what happened, but uh, obviously there's tools available to these criminals that they can utilize. Uh, stealing the credentials, that's T1003, which is credential dumping, listing of the buckets, file and directory discovery, the sync command, which is an exfiltration component, um, uh, access to AWS resources via Tor exit nodes, that's multi-hop proxies being utilized, and then access to AWS resources via VPN services where they're able to acquire and to use third-party infrastructure services. So um, all of these happen to, uh, unfortunately, to, to Capital One uh, in that instance and then during that attack. So let's move now to uh, web applications. Uh, if you're, you know, most of you are probably utilizing web applications inside your organization. They really have taken the world <laughs> by storm there. Um, one of the reasons is because they're very platform independent. They don't require uh, any installs. They can be accessed from anywhere. So if I have a Windows machine, a Mac, a mobile, it's all the same code, right? So it's very popular among organizations. Uh, they live in the cloud. Uh, the browser is really taking place, uh, the place of the operating system in these instances. So it gives, it's a very powerful uh, uh, capability, these web applications. So a lot of organizations are utilizing them often uh, and Obviously, the criminals recognize this. Uh, they're always looking for new attack surfaces. 
in this case, uh, web applications tend to be a big attack service. And if we look again, go back to the Verizon data breach report for 2020, you can see here web applications were involved in 43% of breaches. So big increase doubled from 2019 um, uh, or the, the previous year. Uh, and, and again, they're involved in, in almost half of the breaches we saw that Verizon saw uh, across the world where, where web applications were involved, you can see. And then if you look at the, the third one there, 37% of breaches used stole or used credentials. So that's, uh, those are the, the bigger, the two big things uh, to take away here, web applications and, and, and stolen credentials. Um, some of the vulnerabilities we see in web applications, SQL injection is big, that leads to data exfiltration. Uh, OS command injection leads to remote command execution. So what they're looking to do, you know, is again, if somebody is, is coming to these uh, web pages, uh, they, are, they are installing uh, SQL injection, they're doing cross-site scripting, all of these ways that can target the, um, the person coming to these web applications or web pages and allows them to uh, take advantage of that, right? They can, they can do remote code execution on those systems if they have uh, capabilities and they've built that into compromising those web applications. Um, we we'll also see sensitive data exposure. I talk about data exfiltration, right? A um, lot of uh, lack of data protection in the cloud is causing a lot of this. Um, as organizations build their cloud infrastructure and start moving a lot of data into the cloud, uh, again, looking at uh, one, it's new to them. Uh, two, there's a lot of misconfigurations. Uh, you can see some of the examples of some of the data that we, we have seen in a lot of these cloud attacks um, that are being stolen, credit card data, healthcare data, personal data. Uh, and a lot of this stuff is stored without encryption, which is um, you know, obviously a, a, a a no-no, uh, but uh, we are definitely seeing that uh, out there. Because again, you know, when when people first start utilizing cloud infrastructure, um, they may not be as as trained up on all of the capabilities of of what can be done in the cloud that they could do on premise. So um, in some cases, they may miss some steps, so they don't realize they can do things in the cloud that uh, the same things in the cloud that they could do on premise. Um, weak encryption algorithms, uh, we see a lot. Security misconfigurations, as we mentioned. Uh, let's talk a little bit about misconfigurations, right? Um, we have a, uh, we, we purchased and uh, bought an organization called Cloud Conformity a number um, last year. And one of the things they do is um, uh, cloud security posture management. And so they have hundreds of rules that look at the configurations of cl that cloud accounts are utilizing and doing. And we see 230 million plus misconfigurations found per day through our customer base. Uh, so obviously config misconfigurations are rampant in cloud infrastructures. And you know it's not the fault necessarily of the administrators of these. In a lot of cases, um, again, it, it could be lack of, of training, uh, lack of understanding, um, being forced to get these cloud instances, these cloud infrastructures up as quickly as possible um, without being able to do due diligence in terms of how, how well it is. Plus, you know, there's not a lot of capability out there, tools out there to let you know that there's misconfigurations. So um, that tends to happen. When you look at the top five cloud misconfigurations, and this, this comes from Dark Reading, a, a uh, uh, survey they did back in, in uh, uh, over a year ago, but, uh, but still appropriate today. Number one, storage access. So obviously, again, S3 buckets, you're storing data in these cloud instances. Um, Lots of misconfigurations there. Secrets management. So that's an interesting one where um, people are, are doing secrets management and they obviously misconfigure something and it opens up the, that data to, uh, to uh, attack. Disabled logging and monitoring. So again, you know, there is logging and monitoring uh, uh, available in a lot of these cloud infrastructures, 
but people don't realize it. They've disabled it for some reason, or they haven't even enabled it in the first place. So in a lot of cases, you can't see uh, because you aren't logging or you're not monitoring the, uh, uh, the accounts as well as you should be. So it tends to uh, do that. Or for example, as we, we saw in the earlier slide, maybe the, uh, the, the, the attackers have actually disabled that as part of their attack, which they do in a lot of cases, right? So again, trying to, to uh, hide their tracks as they go against an organization, they're going to um, turn off that stuff, right? Uh, Another example, like today, for you know, if we go back to ransomware, one of the things that we see in a ransomware attack today is them actually turning off security agents on those uh, systems. So, in a cloud instance, you're going to have security agent running uh, in your in your cloud instances, and if the if the criminal has access to that security software administrative um, uh, credentials because they've stolen them, for example, or they brute forced them, they're going to turn that stuff off. Uh, and that's going to be a challenge for you as well. Overly permissive access to hosts, containers, and virtual machines. Uh, again, going back to you know, that, that idea of um, least privilege, uh, give the least amount of privileges to the users who have access to this stuff. Um, uh, and, you know, this is where if you have administrative accounts that are utilizing and, and working in a cloud environment, you absolutely need to figure out how can you lock those down. Uh, if you can do two-factor authentication for those accounts, uh, I would say absolutely do that um, because even if they brute force the password, they aren't going to be able to get access to the two-factor component. Uh, rarely, I would say. It's not impossible, uh, but it's very, very uh, highly unlikely that they're going to get access to that device, uh, whether it's your mobile phone or something that does the uh, two-factor piece. So hardening out up those, um, those administrative ac accounts is, is critical. And then lack of validation is one of the other, uh, the fifth one, that misconfiguration that we see. So um, that's just not validating a lot of the, the uh, steps that you've done, lack of validation of the, uh, the setup of the servers, that kind of thing. One of the biggest things that I think is causing a lot of this is just, this is all new tech. These are all new challenges for us. You know, um, you heard earlier, I've been in this industry for 25 years. I didn't take cybersecurity in college. Um, I, I know that some of you younger folks, luckily, have been able to take cybersecurity pro, um, uh, courses now. They're starting to offer those in, in the college uh, university uh, curriculums. But for many of us in this industry, especially us older folks, we learned it all as we went. And, and this tech is coming so fast and so furious that it is very difficult for people to keep up to date. Um, all of us have, have our full-time jobs. Um, you, I, I feel for you IT administrators, you guys are hammered with project after project after project. Doesn't give a lot of time for learning, right? And so, and you look here, right? Amazon Web Services only started in 2006. So it's only been out there for what, uh, 13, 14 years? Pretty short period of time, you, you think about it, right? Microsoft Azure, just came uh, initial release date 2010. So it's only 10 years old. Um, you look at AWS, the number of AWS services that have, they have launched over the years. Back in 2013, there were only 25 services available. In 2019, there were 165 plus services offered just by AWS. So how are you going to learn all that stuff and understand that stuff and be able to implement these things as, as uh, uh, securely as possible? And that's just understanding the tech involved, right? That's not all understanding how attackers are actually going to attack this tech. And that's where our organization has come into play. And when a lot of our researchers, if you look at a lot of our reports, one of the things we always try to do when we, we talk about an industry or talk about an area um, of the technology, we, we, we do have forward looking people that look at how are the, these criminals going to attack this infrastructure? How are they going to attack this technology? 
in order to try and give you some understanding of how that's going to happen. And that's, you know, that's part of what we do. Um, and what I do on a regular basis is trying to just educate people. But, uh, but man, I tell you, organizations just struggle to um, keep up and train, get trained personnel. You know, the other day, uh, last I heard, we have 3 million openings in cybersecurity around the world, right? Um, job openings. Well, with that, um, you know, few people being available to organizations, uh, it's going to be very difficult to hire people that have the expertise, right? Um, even look at uh, Docker, for example, right? Um, back initial date, 2013. Uh, you can see Kubernetes was 2015. And then VMware Tanzu just came out in March of this year. So again, all these new things that are going on, you know, Docker, serverless, um, Kubernetes, all of these are now being implemented as fast as and furious as possible by organizations uh, out there. And so because it's just new tech, it's going to be extremely difficult. And that's why the misconfigurations just abound, right? Like I said, 200 and whatever plus million misconfigurations found every single day because it's just very difficult for, for people to deal with that. We also see a number of IAM credential theft. So this is, in this case, you see IAM credentials baked into containers and cloud instances uh, and published, for example. This one was published on GitHub uh, and people had access to it. The public had access to it. And the person put their credentials right into it and uh, allowed them to uh, take over that account uh, led to an account takeover. So again, you know, people are sharing information. Uh, we see sharing of, of tutorials out there on a regular basis. Um, the criminals have a lot of tutorials available to them in, from the underground. Uh, you can go into the underground today and you can, you know, search for a tutorial on how to crypto mine. You'll find hundreds of those things, right? You'll find tutorials on how to, um, compromise a cloud instance, those are available. So, you know, uh, again, I mentioned that the challenge that we have in training ourselves to understand this tech, well, the criminals are doing education as well and they're being provided with this information from other, other criminals. A lot of the criminals are making money at it because they sell that stuff in the underground to others. So, you know, it's a, uh, the underground, um, uh, markets are thriving with stuff and, and we see tons of cloud discussions in the underground forums that are happening out there today uh, and making it difficult for us because they are getting good at what they do and learning uh, as they go along. Here's another example of a, a code snippet from Pastebin uh, that showed a valid API ID, AWS key that was just posted in Pastebin again. So that's a challenge for, um, you know, if, if people are trying to secure their environment and then you have one of the developers posting this stuff in a public forum, uh, it's going to be very difficult to keep that secure. So again, as you're when you're talking to your developer uh, team, developers, uh, make sure that they understand that um, they should keep that stuff private don't post stuff into Pastebin, especially account credentials. Let's keep those out of any public area that you uh, that's out there on the internet. So how do we secure the cloud? So those were, you know, again, I, hopefully what I tried to do here is give you some ideas of some of the things that are gonna be targeting your cloud infrastructure, right? We went through a number of different scenarios. We talked about the different areas that they're gonna go after. Again, if you want to prioritize, prioritize uh, in your cloud, first and foremost, I would say account credentials. Secure those account credentials. Make sure that they are, um, that if somebody gets access or somebody brute forces that account, make sure it's secure uh, through whatever means, whether that's two-factor authentication or some other means. Uh, but two, misconfigurations, those are huge. Um, uh, hopefully you can make a case with, with uh, management that you need more training and you can and get your, your people trained as much as possible on how to implement this stuff. Uh, it is a shared responsibility model. Everybody hopefully understands that. 
So the cloud provider is going to do their part, but you absolutely have to do your part to secure your cloud in instances and, and your databases and so forth. Um, so you know those those two uh, are immediate. I think is is ways to secure your cloud uh, infrastructure. But let's look at different areas. So again, you know the cloud is a big thing, right? There's lots of moving parts, lots of different areas of the cloud. Um, when you talk to your security vendor, talk to them about, you know, do they have a platform to secure your cloud? And, and again, all the different areas of your cloud. So, excuse me, um, first and foremost on that lower left, workload security is probably your, your, uh, your main thing that you need to secure because workloads are gonna be huge in the cloud, right? You're gonna have instances coming and going. You want to make sure that you have security built into those cloud instances. So when they ramp up or they they spin up, you have a secure um, security agent enabled. Doesn't have to be again. It doesn't have to be on prem. Uh, it it can be cloud based. It can be a service based. Uh, it can spin up with it. So it's it doesn't have to be. You know, it's not like it's a an agent that runs in on your PC, for example, but there's a couple of things you want to look at for workload security. First and foremost, obviously, anti-malware, um, utilizing some form of, of uh, uh, machine learning capability. Uh, the machine learning that has come out recently in terms of uh, protecting against malicious files is going to be great. Uh, it's much better than the the older pattern matching model. Although, you know, we've been in business, Trend Micro has been in business for 32 years now. And obviously we started out with, with signatures. I recently did a, a check in our, in our database in terms of all the files that were detected and how they were detected. And 83% of the time we still detected a file using a signature. So in only 17% of the time did we have to go into utilizing our machine learning or our behavior monitoring capabilities that were there. So signature still works. So make sure you still have some signature capabilities there. For what also it's very fast, it's very efficient. Um, it's very um, uh, not prone to false positives uh, as much as some of the other more proactive uh, methods like, like machine learning, artificial intelligence, behavior monitoring. But you still need those because obviously lots of new malware coming out today. It's a one and done world with malware. So the malware you get in your in your environment is not going to be the same one that your neighbor gets or the, the company down the road gets. Uh, it, it's going to be unique to your um, to your situation. Uh, but workload security, the other aspect of workload security you want to look at is looking at potentially some uh, IPS uh, vulnerability shielding. Uh, vulnerabilities I mentioned earlier are being taken advantage of uh, through exploits by the criminals. So on these, uh, especially on these servers, they're looking for vulnerabilities as a way to get into it. Um, obviously, patching is critical. So if you can patch those things as as well as you can, but if you if you struggle with patching or you want to have a a, a secondary uh, layer of protection. Uh, virtual patching is a good way to do it. Use an IPS, uh, network IPS, host-based IPS capability to do that. Uh, and those can those are available there. You also want to look at um, some of the other technologies uh, that are in there that uh, monitor, uh, do log management, uh, monitoring the logs, et cetera, because so, in case something changes or things. So, so workload security is probably your first foremost. You want to make sure you have that secure. Again, your provider is going to do their part, but you need to add on some things. They're going to manage the vulnerabilities in the in the OS and all that good stuff. But there's there's a, that other layer that you have to um, support, and that's where you're going to have to look at that. And you can you can buy this stuff when you you know if you go to AWS, you go to Azure, the stores. Uh, there's there's uh, security available there that just immediately you know click of the button, it's going to be enabled and and supporting you. Uh, container security. For those that are starting to utilize containers, you want to make sure those are secure. Um, look at technology. Again, those containers need to be uh, managed, whether it's, again, anti-malware, uh, vulnerability uh, protection, 
Uh, those kind of things you want to have available also for containers. And they should be built specifically for containers, purpose built for container security. Uh, because containers and, and serverless and so forth, that's a, a little different beast than just traditional uh, um, uh, agent scanning or traditional server scanning and so forth. So look for technology that is uh, available there. You can also set, in a lot of cases, you can set what, what's set up for your workload security, a lot of the um, uh, policies you do there. You can have it work, do the same policies in container security if it works for you, or you can make it unique to, those, to those er that area of your business. Uh, application security. So as you, uh, this is really where you're talking your DevOps. Um, so if you have DevOps inside your organization, you absolutely want to make sure that they are scanning their applications for vulnerabilities before they, they release them. Um, through the whole process, you want to have to look at building security inside uh, in, into the entire uh, application uh, lifecycle process. So DevOps uh, is becoming more and more um, critical as, you know, as those things, you, you, you know, you are releasing application updates to these applications constantly. We have customers that are, um, that are releasing software uh, patches and updating their applications uh, multiple times daily. And so you want to make sure that you're not publishing with uh, vulnerable applications. And so you have some access there. We even have uh, a partnership with Sneak, who does uh, open source scanning for vulnerabilities, uh, which you know, in, in a lot of cases, in almost all cases, most uh, DevOps are, are starting to utilize uh, open source applications, open source APIs. Those are the kind of things you also want to be scanning for uh, regularly. Uh, file storage security, again, those S3 buckets, that's where you want to make sure they are secure. Um, you aren't, uh, you aren't, you don't have malware going into those file storage. We see a lot of criminals utilizing, for example, um, some of the uh, uh, public cloud sharing uh, areas, they're, they're utilizing those to store and drop malware. They're even using them for, for uh, command and control infrastructure. So you want to make sure if you are utilizing uh, cloud-based file storage that you have that secure as well. And then uh, conformity. And what, what, really what I mean here is the um, cloud um, security posture management. And this is for your misconfigurations. So you want to have technology that is regularly in real time scanning your cloud apps, uh, your cloud accounts for any misconfigurations that are occurring. And so um, if, for example, if one of your, your administrators goes in and, and makes a change to an S3 bucket, you can be alerted that that S3 bucket was just reconfigured to open, be open to the internet. Alert, boom, right? If you make a change that could uh, affect the um, accessibility of it, uh, or something in the uh, in in those cloud instances, you'd be able to be a warned and alerted. You can even do a scan to see what is of what configurations or misconfigurations you have today. So once you deploy it, immediately you can run a scan and see what is what is wrong and make changes immediately there. Um, so misconfigurations, there is capability today. There's technology today uh, for you to help you in that situation. And then lastly, network security. And this is really where you're getting into network IPS capability in the cloud. So instead of having to run IPS locally, you have it in the cloud. So when stuff comes, uh, goes through your, your cloud instance, uh, you are immediately being scanned there for vulnerabilities, for um, malware, for different types of stuff, ransomware, for example, et cetera. Um, so all of these you want to think about as a platform, right? A cloud security platform. That's what you need to talk to your vendors about. Do they have that capability? Can they um, help you in this in, in this area uh, as you're going along? And you know, a lot of you may only be using workload security today, uh, but you may be looking at containers. You may be looking at, at implementing DevOps inside your organization, and you want to start expanding, right? So you don't. This isn't a one size fits all, and it's not one thing only. It doesn't doesn't. You don't have have to do everything, you can piecemeal it together and build a, uh, a really good cloud security strategy around uh, securing your cloud. 
So that's all I had today. Um, I think we can probably open it up to uh, questions now. If you have any questions, uh, would love to hear it. I don't see any at this point, uh, which I'd love to see any if you have any questions. Um, while we're waiting for some questions to be entered, uh, I do want to let you know that um, feel free to stop by our booth in the um, uh, in the area, Trend Micro booth. We've got a bunch of people there helping you and answering questions. I'll be over there in a little bit to answer questions if you have any in the chat there. Um, we're also going to be uh, um, offering a uh, uh, an Apple Watch uh, for people that go there, and we have we can even you can even get a uh, cloud. Uh, assessment uh, from us uh, to see how well you're doing in your cloud. But uh, Joel, I'm not seeing any questions. I don't know. I, I think that there was a lot of information. People are absorbing it all, <laughs> this is my guess, because I found it fascinating. And I, I, I just want to really thank you for get, telling us about the common cloud attack scenarios and the solutions for securing your cloud. Uh -huh. As always, just, it, it's very yeah. interesting stuff. Yeah. Joel, I just saw a question from uh, Emily oh, saying, what okay. advice would you give your to your younger self at the start of your career? <laughs> yeah, well, here's Emily, the questions are coming that. in now. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, you know, I got to tell you that uh, and I, I'm going to be publishing a blog here shortly that talks about the advantage of our of our industry. You know, I answered a, an ad in a newspaper to get a job at Trend Micro 20, 24, 25 years ago. I had no idea what cybersecurity was when I first started, but it is absolutely a wonderful industry. Um, it keeps you on your toes all the time. You know, I would say just become a learner, right? Become just love learning because you're going to have to continue to learning. Uh, you're going to have to continue to learn the technology. Um, open yourself up to that. Uh, try different things. I've been able to try a bunch of different jobs in my company, luckily, um, which has allowed me to stay. So try different things. You know, I was a um, electrical engineer major uh, and, you know, I don't do anything like that at, at Trend Micro. So I've changed my career pretty, uh, but it's been fabulous. Um, the only thing I would say is the one thing I do regret, um, we're, we're a um, Japanese based company. And I always wish I would have started taking Japanese 24 years ago and I'd be fluent by now. Uh, um, so if you want to, if you like languages, I would say over years, try and learn a new language. I just didn't do it. Um, another question from Monica, uh, did you cover any aspects of CASB? I didn't, Monica. I really talked just about the threats that are associated with the cloud. Um, certainly, CASB is a is a uh, area of um, solution that you want to look at uh, for your cloud um, uh, cloud access security bro brokers. So I think you um, it's a good thing. Talk to your vendor, but I really focused more uh, on this on this uh, session about the threats that are targeting cloud infrastructures. So um, I would say go talk to some of the vendors and that are available to you here. Uh, at the event and see what they have available. Uh, what's the best route from Thomas? What's the best route to start in, if you're new to the cloud? Uh, again, you know, I think I think education, learning, um, learning a lot about AWS or Azure, um, depending if you want to focus on one or the other. Uh, I have a brother-in-law that's that's been in IT for many many years, and he is he's becoming an expert on Azure, and he plans to retire here shortly, and he plans to be a consultant on Azure. So uh, he's learning everything you can about Azure uh, by taking classes and learning uh, self-paced learning and things. So um, again, it depends on what you want to do in the cloud. If you want to become a practitioner then you probably want to take some courses and whether it's it's uh, self-paced courses or if you want to go to like the SANS Institute and take some of those classes, you want to go to uh, a Microsoft University or, or AWS University and, and learn about that. I think uh, those are all acceptable. And again, like I said, a lot of universities are starting to open up and have courses in these as well. So um, 
look at your local community college or local uh, universities to see if there are, are classes available. And, you know, I think they, they always like to have older um, students, um, not saying you're old, but um, they like to have students coming in that may not, uh, that be part-time. So uh, I think those are also good ideas. Just like to mention right here in North Carolina, ECU has some fantastic programs. Um, our, uh, our Rob, Mar Rob Martin, our, our very own here, who was a former president, uh, does a lot of training with the ECU students. So if you're in the North Carolina area, highly recommended place to, to go. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and that's the other thing I would say is, is, you know, talk to people at, at ISSA here in Raleigh and, and, and see if they can help you because they, a lot of them are in the same boat you are and, or have been in the past. And they probably have even better advice. You know, like I mentioned, I, I, I'm from Colorado, so I don't know the local community in terms of what's available to you. Um, so certainly um, uh, try to find some people inside uh, the group here and, and see if they can give you some advice. Uh, Emily has another question. I'm trying, how well does a CICD pipeline working for cloud infrastructure? Yeah, I don't think I can answer that question at this time. I apologize, Emily. Maybe I'll try and get a uh, answer for you later and and uh, get that over to you. Sorry about that. And I think we're running up on time here, Joel. But uh, unless anybody has any last minute questions. Nope. OK. Well, thanks everybody for taking the time out of your day. I appreciate you attending my session here and uh, good luck out there. Everybody stay really safe and healthy. And uh, hopefully next year I'll be able to attend in person and meet some of you uh, in person. So with that, I'll say take care, goodbye. And I had a great time. Thanks.